A Midsummer Night's Dream is a comedy written by William Shakespeare in 1595-96. It portrays the events surrounding the marriage of Theseus, the Duke of Athens, to Hippolyta, the former queen of the Amazons. These include the adventures of four young Athenian lovers and a group of six amateur actors, the Mechanicals who are controlled and manipulated by the fairies who inhabit the forest in which most of the play is set. The play is one of Shakespeare's most popular works for the stage and is widely performed across the world. Plot The play consists of four interconnecting plots, connected by a celebration of the wedding of Duke Theseus of Athens and the Amazon Queen. Hippolyta, which is set simultaneously in the woodland and in the realm of fairyland, under the light of the moon. The play opens with Hermia, who is in love with Lysander. Resistant to her father Aegis demand that she wed Demetrius, whom he has arranged for her to marry. Helena meanwhile pines unrequitedly for Demetrius. Enraged, Aegeus invokes an ancient Athenian law before Duke Theseus whereby a daughter must marry the suitor chosen by her father, or else face death. Theseus offers her another choice, lifelong chastity while worshipping the goddess Artemis as a nun. Peter Quince and his fellow players Nick Bottom, Francis Flute, Robin Starveling, Tom Snout, and Snug plan to put on a play for the wedding of the Duke and the Queen, the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus and Thisbe. Quinns reads the names of characters and bestows them to the players. Nick Bottom, who is playing the main role of Pyramus, is over-enthusiastic and wants to dominate others by suggesting himself to the characters of Bisbee, the Lion, and Pyramus at the same time. He would also rather be a tyrant and recite some lines of Urkel's. Bottom is told by Quince that he would do the Lion so terribly as to frighten the Duchess and ladies enough for the Duke and Lords to have the players hanged. Quinn sends the meeting with at the Duke's Oak we meet. Quote, in a parallel plotline, Oberon, King of the Fairies, and Titania, his queen, have come to the forest outside Athens. Titania tells Oberon that she plans to stay there until she has attended Theseus and Hippolyta's wedding. Oberon and Titania are estranged because Titania refuses to give her Indian changeling to Oberon for use as his knight or henchman. Since the child's mother was one of Titania's worshippers, Oberon seeks to punish Titania's disobedience. He calls upon Robin, Puck Goodfellow, his rude and knavish sprite. Hermia and Lysander have escaped to the same forest in hopes of eloping. Helena, desperate to reclaim Demetrius's love, tells Demetrius about the plan and he follows them in hopes of killing Lysander. Helena continually makes advances towards Demetrius, promising to love him more than Hermia. However, he rebuffs her with cruel insults against her. Observing this, Oberon orders Puck to spread some of the magical juice from the flower on the eyelids of the young, Athenian man. Instead, Puck mistakes Lysander for Demetrius, not having actually seen either before, and administers the juice to the sleeping Lysander. Helena, coming across him, wakes him while attempting to determine whether he is dead or asleep. Upon this happening, Lysander immediately falls in love with Helena. Oberon sees Demetrius still following Hermia and is enraged. When Demetrius goes to sleep, Oberon sends Puck to get Helena while he charms Demetrius's eyes. Upon waking up, he sees Helena. Now, both men are in pursuit of Helena. However, she is convinced that her two suitors are mocking her, as neither loved her originally. Hermia is at a loss to see why her lover has abandoned her, and accuses Helena of stealing Lysander away from her. The four quarrel with each other until Lysander and Demetrius become so enraged that they seek a place to duel to prove whose love for Helena is the greater. Oberon orders Puck to keep Lysander and Demetrius from catching up with one another and to remove the charm from Lysander so Lysander can return to love Hermia, while Demetrius continues to love Helena. 
a drawing of Puck, Titania and Bottom in A Midsummer Night's Dream from Act 3. See me by Charles Buchel. Meanwhile, Quince and his band of six laborers, rude mechanicals, as they are described by Puck, have arranged to perform their play about Pyramus and Thisbe for Theseus' wedding and venture into the forest, near Titania's bower. For their rehearsal, Bottom is spotted by Puck, who, taking his name to be another word for a jackass, transforms his head into that of a donkey. When Bottom returns for his next lines, the other workmen run screaming in terror. They claim that they are haunted, much to Bottom's confusion. Determined to await his friends, he begins to sing to himself. Titania, having received the love potion, is awakened by Bottom singing and immediately falls in love with him. She lavishes him with the attention of her and her fairies, and while she is in this state of devotion, Oberon takes the changeling. Having achieved his goals, Oberon releases Titania, orders Puck to remove the donkey head from Bottom, and arranges everything so Helena, Hermia, Demetrius and Lysander will all believe they have been dreaming when they awaken. Puck distracts Lysander and Demetrius from fighting over Helena's love by mimicking their voices, and leading them apart. Eventually, all four find themselves separately falling asleep in the glade. Once they fall asleep, Puck administers the love potion to Lysander again, claiming all will be well in the morning. The fairies then disappear, and Theseus and Hippolyta arrive on the scene. During an early morning hunt, they wake the lovers and, since Demetrius no longer loves Hermia, Theseus overrules Aegeus's demands and arranges a group wedding. The lovers decide that the night's events must have been a dream. After they exit, Bottom awakes, and he too decides that he must have experienced a dream past the wit of man. In Athens, Theseus, Hippolyta and the lovers watch the six workmen perform Pyramus and Thisbe. The performers are so terrible playing their roles that the guests laugh as if it were meant to be a comedy, and everyone retires to bed. Afterwards, Oberon, Titania, Puck, and other fairies enter, and bless the house and its occupants with good fortune. After all the other characters leave, Puck restores immense and suggests to the audience that what they just experienced might be nothing more than a dream. Characters The Athenians The Fairies The Mechanicals Historical Criticism Dorothea Keller has attempted to trace the criticism of the work through the centuries. The earliest such piece of criticism was a 1662 entry in the private diary of Samuel Pepys. He found the play to be the most ridiculous one he had ever seen. He did, however, admit to liking the dancing involved in the performance he viewed. He also liked the handsome women of the cast. Charles Gildon in the early 18th century recommended this play for its beautiful reflections, descriptions, similes, and topics. Gildan thought that Shakespeare drew inspiration from the works of Ovid and Virgil, and that he could read them in the original Latin and not in later translations. William Duff, writing in the 1770s, also recommended this play. He felt the depiction of the supernatural was among Shakespeare's strengths, not weaknesses. He especially praised the poetry and wit of the fairies, and the quality of the verse involved. Edward Malone, a Shakespearean scholar and critic of the late 18th century, found another supposed flaw in this particular play, its lack of a proper decorum. He found that the more exalted characters, the aristocrats of Athens, are subservient to the interests of those beneath them. In other words, the lower class characters play larger roles than their betters and overshadow them. He found this to be a grave error of the writer. Keller argues that the 19th century found the play receiving more important critical attention. In 1808, August Wilhelm Schlegel had significant critical views on this play. He perceived unity in the multiple plot lines. He noted that the donkey head is not a random transformation 
but reflects Bottom's true nature. He identified the tale of Pyramus and Thisbe as a burlesque of the Athenian lovers. In 1811, 1812, Samuel Taylor Coleridge made two points of criticism about this play. The first was that the entire play should be seen as a dream. Second, that Helena is guilty of ungrateful treachery to Hermia. He thought that this was a reflection of the lack of principles in women, who are more likely to follow their own passions and inclinations than men. Women, in his view, feel less abhorrence for moral evil, though they are concerned with its outward consequences. In 1837, William Magin produced essays on the play. He turned his attention to the speech of Theseus about the lunatic, the lover, and the poet and to the response of Hippolyta to it. He regarded Theseus as the voice of Shakespeare himself and the speech as a call of imaginative audiences. In 1839, the philosopher Hermann Ulrich wrote that the play and its depiction of human life reflected the views of Platonism. In his view, Shakespeare implied that human life is nothing but a dream, suggesting influence from Plato and his followers who thought human reality is deprived of all genuine existence. In 1849, Charles Knight also wrote about the play and its apparent lack of proper social stratification. He thought that this play indicated Shakespeare's maturity as a playwright, and that its, the Sean Harmony, of Athenian society reflects proper decorum of character. He also viewed Bottom as the best-drawn character, with his self-confidence, authority, and self-love. He argued that Bottom the Weaver, stands as a representative of the whole human race. Also in 1849, Georg Gottfried Trevinus wrote extensively about the play, he denied the theory that this play should be seen as a dream. He argued that it should be seen as an ethical construct and an allegory. He thought that it was an allegorical depiction of the errors of sensual love, which is likened to a dream. Gervinus also wrote on where the fairyland of the play is located, not in Attica, but in the Indies. His views on the Indies seem to Keller to be influenced by Orientalism. He speaks of the Indies as scented with the aroma of flowers and is the place where mortals live, in the state of a half-dream. Gervinus wrote with elitist disdain about the mechanicals of the play and their acting aspirations. He described them as homely creatures with hard hands and thick heads. They are, in his view, ignorant men, who compose and act in plays merely for financial reward. They are not real artists. In 1863, Charles Cowden Clark also wrote on this play. Keller notes, he was the husband of famous Shakespearean scholar Mary Cowden Clark. In 1872, Henry N. Hudson, an American clergyman and editor of Shakespeare, also wrote comments on this play. Keller pays little attention to his writings, as they were largely derivative of previous works. She notes, however, that Hudson too believed that the play should be viewed as a dream. He cited the lightness of the characterization as supporting of his view. Henry A. Clapp and Henry Howard Furness were both more concerned with the problem of the play's duration, though they held opposing views. In 1895-1896, Georg Brandis worked on his own views on the play. He was the last major critic of the 19th century to deal with the work, in 1964, R. W. Dent argued against theories that the exemplary model of love in the play is the rational love of Theseus and Hippolyta. He argued that in this work, love is inexplicable. It is the offspring of imagination, not reason. However, the exemplary love of the play is one of an imagination controlled and restrained, and avoids the excesses of dotage. Genuine love is contrasted with the unrequited love, and dotage, of Demetrius for Hermia, and with the supposed love, and dotage, of Titania for an unworthy object. Dent also denied the rationality and wisdom typically attributed to Theseus. He reminded his readers that this is the character of Theseus from Greek mythology, a creation himself of antique fable. Theseus' views on art are far from rational or wise. 
He can't tell the difference between an actual play and its interlude. The interlude of the play's acting troupe is less about the art and more of an expression of the mechanical's distrust of their own audience. They fear the audience's reactions will be either excessive or inadequate, and say so on stage. Theseus fails to get the message. Also in 1964, Jan could offered his own, rather controversial, views on the play. He viewed as main themes of the play violence and unrepressed animalistic sexuality. Both Lysander and Demetrius are, in his view, verbally brutal lovers. Their love interests are exchangeable and objectified. The changeling that Oberon desires is his new, sexual toy. The aristocrats of the play, both mortal and immortal, are promiscuous. As for the Athenian lovers following their night in the forest, they are ashamed to talk about it because that night liberated them from themselves and social norms, and allowed them to reveal their real selves. In 1967, John A. Allen theorized that bottom is a symbol of the animalistic aspect of humanity. He also thought bottom was redeemed through the maternal tenderness of Titania, which allowed him to understand the love and self-sacrifice of Pyramus and Thisbe. In 1969, Michael Taylor argued that previous critics offered a too cheerful view of what the play depicts. He emphasized the less pleasant aspects of the otherwise appealing fairies and the nastiness of the mortal Demetrius prior to his enchantment. He argued that the overall themes are the often painful aspects of love and the pettiness of people, which here include the fairies. In 1970, R. A. Zimbardo viewed the play as full of symbols, the moon and its phases alluded to in the play. In his view, stand for permanence and mutability. The play uses the principle of discordia concours in several of its key scenes. Theseus and Hippolyta represent marriage and, symbolically, the reconciliation of the natural seasons or the phases of time. Hippolyta's story arc is that she must submit to Theseus and become a matron. Titania has to give up her motherly obsession with the changeling boy and passes through a symbolic death, and Oberon has to once again woo and win his wife. In 1971, James L. Calderwood offered a new view on the role of Oberon. He viewed the king as specializing in the arts of illusion. Oberon, in his view, is the interior dramatist of the play, orchestrating events. He is responsible for the play's happy ending, when he influences Theseus to overrule Aegeus and allow the lovers to marry. Oberon and Theseus bring harmony out of discord. Also in 1971, Andrew D. Wiener argued that the play's actual theme is unity. The poet's imagination creates unity by giving form to diverse elements and the writer is addressing the spectator's own imagination which also creates and perceives unity. Also writing in 1971, Hugh M. Richmond offered an entirely new view of the play's love storylines. He argued that what passes for love in this play is actually a self-destructive expression of passion. He argued that the play's significant characters are all affected by passion and by sadomasochistic type of sexuality. This passion prevents the lovers from genuinely communicating with each other. At the same time it protects them from the disenchantment with the love interest that communication inevitably brings. In 1972, Ralph Barry argued that Shakespeare was chiefly concerned with epistemology in this play. The lovers declare illusion to be reality. The actors declare reality to be illusion. The play ultimately reconciles the seemingly opposing views and vindicates imagination. In 1974, Marjorie Garber argued that metamorphosis is both the major subject of the play and the model of its structure. She noted that, in this play, the entry in the woods is a dreamlike change in perception, a change which affects both the characters and the audience. Dreams here take priority over reason and are truer than the reality they seek to interpret and transform. In 1975, Ronald F. Miller expresses his view that the play is a study in the epistemology of imagination. 
He focused on the role of the fairies, who have a mysterious aura of evanescence and ambiguity. In 1979, M. E. Lamb suggested that the play may have borrowed an aspect of the ancient myth of Theseus, the Athenians' entry into the labyrinth of the Minotaur. The woods of the play serve as a metaphorical labyrinth, and for Elizabethans the woods were often an allegory of sexual sin. The lovers in the woods conquer irrational passion and find their way back. Bottom with his animal head becomes a comical version of the Minotaur. Bottom also becomes the Ariadne's thread which guides the lovers. In having the new Minotaur rescue rather than threaten the lovers, the classical myth is comically inverted. Also in 1979, Harold F. Brooks agreed that the main theme of the play, its very heart, is desire and its culmination in marriage. All other subjects are of lesser importance, including that of imagination and that of appearance and reality. Also in 1980, R. Chris Hassel, Jr. Some of the interpretations of the play have been based on psychology and its diverse theories. In 1972, Alex Aronson argued that Theseus represents the conscious mind and Puck represents the unconscious mind. Puck, in this view, is a guise of the unconscious as a trickster, while remaining subservient to Oberon. Aronson thought that the play explores unauthorized desire and linked it to the concept of fertility. He viewed the donkey and the trees as fertility symbols. The love as sexual desires are symbolized in their forest encounters. In 1981, Mordecai Marcus argued for a new meaning of arrows, love, and Thanatos, death. In this play, in his view, Shakespeare suggests that love requires the risk of death. Love achieves force and direction from the interweaving of the life impulse with the deathward release of sexual tension. He also viewed the play as suggesting that the healing force of love is connected to the acceptance of death, and vice versa. In 1987, Jan Lawson Heinle argued that this play has a therapeutic value. Shakespeare in many ways explores the sexual fears of the characters, releases them, and transforms them, and the happy ending is the re-establishment of social harmony. Patriarchy itself is also challenged and transformed, as the men offer their women a loving equality, one founded on respect and trust. She even viewed Titania's loving acceptance of the donkey-headed bottom as a metaphor for basic trust. This trust is what enables the warring and uncertain lovers to achieve their sexual maturity. In 1991, Barbara Friedman Themes in the story Carnivalesque Both David Wiles of the University of London and Harold Bloom of Yale University have strongly endorsed the reading of this play under the themes of Carnivalesque, Bacchanalia, and Saturnalia. Love David Bevington argues that the play represents the dark side of love. He writes that the fairies make light of love by mistaking the lovers and by applying a love potion to Titania's eyes, forcing her to fall in love with an S. Helena and Demetrius are both oblivious to the dark side of their love, totally unaware of what may have come of the events in the forest. Problem with time there is a dispute over the scenario of the play as it is cited at first by Theseus that four happy days bring in another moon, which creates a real confusion. It is possible that the moon set during the night allowing Lysander to escape in the moonlight and for the actors to rehearse, then for the wood episode to occur without moonlight. Theseus's statement can also be interpreted to mean four days until the next month. Another possibility is that, since each month there are roughly four consecutive nights that the moon is not seen due to its closeness to the sun in the sky, the two nights before the moment of new moon, followed by the two following it, it may in this fashion indicate a liminal, dark of the moon, period full of magical possibilities. This is further supported by Hippolyta's opening lines exclaiming, and then the moon, like to a silver bow new bent in heaven, shall behold the night of our solemnities. Quote, 
the thin crescent-shaped moon being the hallmark of the new moon's return to the skies each month. The play also intertwines the midsummer eve of the title with May Day, furthering the idea of a confusion of time and the seasons. This is evidenced by Theseus commenting on some slumbering youths that they observe the rite of May. Act 4, Scene 1 Loss of Individual Identity Maurice Hunt, Chair of the English Department at Baylor University, writes of the blurring of the identities of fantasy and reality in the play that make possible that pleasing, narcotic dreaminess associated with the fairies of the play. Similarly, this failure to identify and to distinguish is what leads Puck to mistake one set of lovers for another in the forest, placing the flower's juice on Lysander's eyes instead of Demetrius's. Victor Kiernan, a Marxist scholar and historian, writes that it is for the greater sake of love that this loss of identity takes place and that individual characters are made to suffer accordingly. It was the more extravagant cult of love that struck sensible people as irrational and likely to have dubious effects on its acolytes. The aesthetic scholar David Marshall draws out this theme even further. Ambiguous Sexuality In his essay, Preposterous Pleasures, Queer Theories and A Midsummer Night's Dream, Douglas E. Green explores possible interpretations of alternative sexuality that he finds within the text of the play. In juxtaposition to the proscribed social mores of the culture at the time the play was written, he writes that his essay does not seek to rewrite A Midsummer Night's Dream as a gay play but rather explores some of its homoerotic significations, moments of queer disruption and eruption in this Shakespearean comedy albeit all the characters are played by males. Feminism Male dominance is one thematic element found in A Midsummer Night's Dream. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, Lysander and Hermia escape into the woods for a night where they do not fall under the laws of Theseus or Aegeus. Upon their arrival in Athens, the couples are married, Marriage is seen as the ultimate social achievement for women while men can go on to do many other great things and gain societal recognition. There are points in the play, however, when there is an absence of patriarchal control. In his book Power on Display, Leonard Tenenhouse says the problem in A Midsummer Night's Dream is the problem of authority. Gone archaic. Religious. It has been well established for two centuries that Puck and Robin Goodfellow are both names for the devil from English folklore. Cena argues that the character of Wall, acted by Snout, represents the partition that exists between Earth and Heaven and that comes down on the Day of Apocalypse. Pyramus and Thisbe are a late Renaissance allegory for Jesus and the Christian Church, and that the source of the names Peter, Petros, Greek for a stone, and quince, coin, a term for a wedge-shaped cornerstone. Performance History 17th and 18th Centuries During the years of the Puritan Interregnum when the theaters were closed, the comic subplot of Bottom and his compatriots was performed as a troll. Trolls were comical playlets, often adapted from the subplots of Shakespearean and other plays that could be attached to the acts of acrobats and jugglers and other allowed performances, thus circumventing the ban against drama. When the theaters reopened in 1660, A Midsummer Night's Dream was acted in adapted form. Like many other Shakespearean plays, Samuel Pepys saw it on the 29th of September 1662 and thought it the most insipid, ridiculous play that ever I saw. Quote, after the Jacobean, Caroline era, A Midsummer Night's Dream was never performed in its entirety until the 1840s. Instead, it was heavily adapted in forms like Henry Purcell's musical mask, Play the Fairy Queen, which had a successful run at the Dorset Garden Theatre, but was not revived. Richard Leverage turned the Pyramus and Thisbe scenes into an Italian opera burlesque, acted at Lincoln's Infields in 1716, 
John Frederick Lamp elaborated upon Leverage's version in 1745. Charles Johnson had used the Pyramus and Thisbe material in the finale of Love in a Forest. His 1723 adaptation of As You Like It. In 1755, David Garrick did the opposite of what had been done a century earlier. He extracted Bottom and his companions and acted the rest. In an adaptation called The Fairies, Frederick Reynolds produced an operatic version in 1816, the Victorian stage. In 1840, Madame Vestris at Covent Garden returned the play to this stage with a relatively full text, adding musical sequences and balletic dances. Vestris took the role of Oberon, and for the next 70 years, Oberon and Puck would always be played by women. After the success of Madame Vestris production, 19th century theatre continued to stage the dream as a spectacle, often with a cast numbering nearly 100. Detailed sets were created for the palace and the forest, and the fairies were portrayed as gossamer-winged ballerinas. The overture by Felix Mendelssohn was always used throughout this period. Augustine Daly's production opened in 1895 in London and ran for 21 performances. The special effects were constructed by the Martinka Magic Company, which was later owned by Houdini. 20th and 21st Centuries Vince Cardinale is Puck from the Carmel Shakespeare Festival production of A Midsummer Night's Dream, September 2000. Performance Saratov Puppet Theatre, Teramic, A Midsummer Night's Dream based on the play by William Shakespeare. Max Reinhardt staged A Midsummer Night's Dream 13 times between 1905 and 1934, introducing a revolving set. After he fled Germany he devised a more spectacular outdoor version at the Hollywood Bowl. In September 1934, the shell was removed and replaced by a forest planted in tons of dirt hauled in especially for the event, and a trestle was constructed from the hills to the stage. The wedding procession inserted between Acts IV and V crossed the trestle with torches down the hillside. The cast included James Cagney, Olivia de Havilland, Mickey Rooney and Victor Jory, and a corps of dancers which included Catherine Dunham and Butterfly McQueen. With Mendelssohn's music, on the strength of this production, Warner Brothers signed Reinhardt to direct a filmed version. Hollywood's first Shakespeare movie since Douglas Fairbanks Sr. and Mary Pickford's Taming of the Shrew in 1929, Rooney, Puck, and de Havilland, Hermia and Zara, were the only holdovers from the Hollywood Bowl cast. James Cagney starred, in his only Shakespearean role, as Bottom. Other actors in the film who played Shakespearean roles just this once include Joey, Brown and Dick Powell, Eric Wolfgang Korngold was brought from Austria to arrange Mendelssohn's music for the film. He not only used the Midsummer Night's Dream music but also several other pieces by Mendelssohn. Korngold went on to make a Hollywood career, remaining in the US after Nazi Germany annexed Austria. Director Harley Granville Barker introduced in 1914 a less spectacular way of staging the dream. He reduced the size of the cast and used Elizabethan folk music instead of Mendelssohn. He replaced large, complex sets with a simple system of patterned curtains. He portrayed the fairies as golden robotic insectoid creatures based on Cambodian idols. His simpler, sparer staging significantly influenced subsequent productions. In 1970, Peter Brook staged the play for the Royal Shakespeare Company in a blank white box, in which masculine fairies engaged in circus tricks such as trapeze artistry. Brook also introduced the subsequently popular idea of doubling Theseus, Oberon and Hippolyta, Titania, as if to suggest that the world of the fairies is a mere version of the world of the mortals. British actors who played various roles in Brook's production included Patrick Stewart, Ben Kingsley, John Payne, Puck, and Francis de la Tour. Helena, since Brooks' production, directors have used their imaginations freely in staging the play. 
In particular, there has been an increased use of sexuality on stage, as many directors see the palace as a symbol of restraint and repression, while the wood is a symbol of unrestrained sexuality, both liberating and terrifying. A Midsummer Night's Dream has been produced many times in New York, including several stagings by the New York Shakespeare Festival at the Delacorte Theatre in Central Park, a production by the Theatre for a New Audience, produced by Joseph Papp at the Public Theatre. In 1978, the Riverside Shakespeare Company staged an outdoor production starring Eric Hoffman as Puck, with Karen Hurley as Titania and Eric Conger as Oberon. Directed by company founder Gloria Skursky, there have been several variations since then, including some set in the 1980s. The University of Michigan's Nichols Arboretum's program Shakespeare in the Arb has presented a play every summer since 2001. Shakespeare in the Arb has produced A Midsummer Night's Dream three times. These performances in the first production of Emma Rice as the artistic director of Shakespeare's Globe. She has carried the play to Indies, with Indian characters, probably a reference to Gerbinus, changing the characters from Athenians to Hoxton hipsters, and creating an all-male love triangle between Lysander, Demetrius and Helenus, a male Helena. The play was carried to a more gender-fluid era, the last performance was broadcast live all around the world through Internet. Literary St. John's Eve written in 1853 by Henrik Ibsen relies heavily on the Shakespearean play. Neil Gaiman's comic series The Sandman uses the play as a focal point in issue No. 19. In it, Shakespeare and his company perform the play for the real Oberon and Titania and an audience of fairies. The play is heavily quoted in the comic. Shakespeare's son Hamnet Shakespeare appears in the play as the Indian boy. It is strongly hinted that he is later taken away by Titania. Much like the changeling in the story, this issue was the first and only comic to win the World Fantasy Award for Best Short Fiction. In 1991, Michael Gow's play, Away, features intertextual references to A Midsummer Night's Dream, and opens with a performance of the final part, with the protagonist, Tom, in a role similar to that of Puck. In Ballet Shoes, a children's novel by Noel Streetfield, published in 1936, the three sisters Pauline, Petrova and Posey perform in A Midsummer Night's Dream as dancers and actors, Musical versions Henry Purcell The Fairy Queen by Henry Purcell consists of a set of masks meant to go between acts of the play, as well as considerable rewriting of the play to be current to 17th century audiences. In 1826, Felix Mendelssohn composed a concert overture, inspired by the play, that was first performed in 1827. In 1842, Partly because of the fame of the overture, and partly because his employer King Friedrich Wilhelm IV of Prussia liked the incidental music that Mendelssohn had written for other plays that had been staged at the palace in German. Translation Mendelssohn was commissioned to write incidental music for a production of A Midsummer Night's Dream that was to be staged in 1843 in Potsdam. He incorporated the existing overture into the incidental music, which was used in most stage versions through the 19th century. The best known of the pieces from the incidental music is the famous Wedding March, frequently used as a recessional in weddings. The choreographer Marius Petipa, more famous for his collaborations with Tchaikovsky on the ballet's Swan Lake and the Sleeping Beauty, made another ballet adaptation for the Imperial Ballet of St. Petersburg with additional music and adaptations to Mendelssohn's score by Eli Akuto and Minkus. The revival premiered the 14th of July 1876. English choreographer Frederick Ashton also created a 40-minute ballet version of the play, retitled to The Dream. George Balanchine was another to create a Midsummer Night's Dream ballet based on the play using Mendelssohn's music. 
Between 1917 and 1939 Karl Orff also wrote incidental music for a German version of the play, Ein Sommer Nordstrom, performed in 1939. Since Mendelssohn's parents were Jews who converted to Lutheranism, his music had been banned by the Nazi regime, and the Nazi cultural officials put out a call for new music, for the play. Orff was one of the musicians who responded. He later reworked the music for a final version, completed in 1964. Ralph Von Williams' Overhill, Overdale, from Act Two, is the third of the three Shakespeare songs set to music by the British composer Ralph Vaughan Williams. He wrote the pieces for a cappella SATB choir in 1951 for the British Federation of Music Festivals and they remain the popular part of British choral repertoire today. Benjamin Britten The play was adapted into an opera, with music by Benjamin Britten and libretto by Britten and Peter Pears. The opera was first performed on the 11th of June 1960 at Aldberg. Moonwork The Theatre Company, Moonwork put on a production of Midsummer in 1999. It was conceived by Mason Pettit. Gregory Sherman and Gregory Wolf, who directed it. The show featured a rock opera version of the play within a play, Pyramus and Thisbe with music written by Rusty McGee. The music for the rest of the show was written by Andrew Sherman. The Donkey Show The Donkey Show is a disco-era experience based on A Midsummer Night's Dream that first appeared off-Broadway in 1999. Other in 1949 the three-act opera by Delanois entitled Puck was premiered in Strasbourg. Progressive rock guitarist Steve Hackett, best known for his work with Genesis, made a classical adaptation of the play in 1997. Hans Werner Hens's Eighth Symphony is inspired by sequences from the play. D. Alexander W. Dreyfus School of the Arts Theatre Department presented the show as a musical adapted, directed by Beverly Blanchett, produced by Marcy Gorman, using the songs of the Moody Blues. The show was called Midsummer and was subsequently performed at Morzani Halfstra's Performing Arts Center in Tampa, at the Florida State International Thespian Society Festival. Text, Concept, Copyright, the 9th of December 2011. In 2011, Opera Memphis, Playhouse on the Square, and contemporary a cappella groups Delta Acapella and Riva, premiered Michael King's A Midsummer Night's Dream, Opera A Capella. Ballets George Balanchine's A Midsummer Night's Dream, his first original full-length ballet, was premiered by the New York City Ballet on 17 January 1962. It was chosen to open the NYCB's first season at the New York State Theater at Lincoln Center in 1964. Balanchine interpolated further music by Mendelssohn into his dream, including the overture for May Valley. Frederick Ashton created the dream, a short, not full-length, ballet set exclusively to the famous music by Felix Mendelssohn, arranged by John Lanchbury. In 1964, it was created on England's Royal Ballet and has since entered the repertoire of other companies, notably the Joffrey Ballet and American Ballet Theatre. John Neumeyer created his full-length ballet Ein Summer Nordstrom for his company at the Hamburg State Opera, Hamburgish Staatsoper, in 1977, longer than Ashton's or Balanchine's earlier versions. Neumeyer's version includes other music by Mendelssohn along with the Midsummer Night's Dream music, as well as music from the modern composer Georgias, Ndor Lagetti, and John T. Barrel organ music. Neumeyer devotes the three sharply differing musical styles to the three character groups, with the aristocrats and nobles dancing to Mendelssohn, the fairies to Lagetti, and the rustics or mechanicals to the barrel organ. Elvis Costello composed the music for a full-length ballet Il Sogno, based on A Midsummer Night's Dream. The music was subsequently released as a classical album by Deutsche Grammophon in 2004. Film Adaptations 
1935 film version was directed by Max Reinhardt and William Dieterle. The cast included James Cagney as Bottom, Mickey Rooney as Puck, Olivia de Havilland as Hermia, Joey Brown as Francis Flute, Dick Powell as Lysander and Victor Jory as Oberon. A 1968 film version was directed by Peter Hall. The cast include Paul Rogers as Bottom, Ian Holm as Puck, Diana Rigg as Helena, Helen Mirren as Hermia, Ian Richardson as Oberon, Judy Dench as Titania, and Sebastian Shaw as Quince. This film stars the Royal Shakespeare Company, and is directed by Peter Hall. A 1969 film version was directed by Jean Christophe Everty. The cast included Jean-Claude Druitt as Oberon, Claude Jade as Helena, Christine de la Roche as Hermia, Marie Versini as Hippolyta, Michel Moto as Flute, Guy Grosso as Cans, A Midsummer Night's Dream, Sen Noci Svot Oi, NSK Acute was directed by Czech animator Yuri Trinka. This was a stop-motion puppet film that followed Shakespeare's story simply with a narrator. The English-language version was narrated by Richard Burton. A Midsummer Night's Sex Comedy was written and directed by Woody Allen. The plot is loosely based on Ingmar Bergman's Smiles of a Summer Night, with some elements from Shakespeare's play. Bottom's Dream was an animated short directed by John Kane Maker, showing events of the play from the point of view of Bottom. The film uses selections of Mendelssohn's music, lines from the play, and surreal imagery to convey Bottom's experience. Dead Poets Society features the play as a production for which Neil Perry tries out for and wins. The role of Puck, in spite of his father's disapproval of his acting aspirations. A 1996 adaptation directed by Adrian Noble. The cast included Desmond Barrett as Bottom, Finbar Lynch as Puck, Alex Jennings as Oberon, Theseus, and Lindsay Duncan as Titania, Hippolyta. This film is based on Noble's hugely popular Royal Shakespeare Company production. Its art design is eccentric, featuring a forest of floating light bulbs and a giant umbrella for Titania's bower. A 1999 film version was written and directed by Michael Hoffman. The cast includes Kevin Klein as Bottom, Rupert Everett as Oberon, Michelle Pfeiffer as Titania, Stanley Tucci as Puck, Sophie Marceau as Hippolyta, Christian Bale as Demetrius, Dominic West as Lysander, and Callista Flockhart as Helena. This adaptation relocates the play's action from Athens to a fictional, Monte Athena, located in Tuscany, Italy, although all textual mentions of Athens are retained. A 1999 version was written and directed by James Kerwin. The cast included Travis Schult as Demetrius. It set the story against a surreal backdrop of techno clubs and ancient symbols. The Children's Midsummer Night's Dream directed by Christine Edzard, was produced by Sands Films at their studio in Rotherith, London using 350 school children from Southwark, between the ages of 8 and 11, all theatrically untrained. The sets and costumes were designed to scale and made on site. A Midsummer Night's Rave directed by Gil Cates Jr. changes the setting to a modern rave. Puck is a drug dealer. The magic flower called Love in Idleness is replaced with magic ecstasy. And the king and queen of fairies are the host of the rave and the DJ. A Midsummer Night's Matrix directed by Craig Parsley features a class of fifth graders interpreting the play through a technological lens, where the world mind features a modern interpretation of the play put on in a private high school in a small town. TV Productions The Play Within a Play, from Act 5, Scene I, Pyramus and Thisbe, was performed by the members of the British pop music group The Beatles on 28 April 1964 for a British television special, Around the Beatles, Paul McCartney appeared as Pyramus, John Lennon as Thisbe, George Harrison as Moonshine, and Ringo Starr as Lion. The performance, before a live audience, 
was done with a great comic intent and included a number of intentional hecklers. This was broadcast in the UK on ITV on the 6th of May, and in the US on ABC on the 15th of November. The 1981 BBC television Shakespeare production was produced by Jonathan Miller and directed by Elijah Mashinsky. It starred Helen Mirren as Titania, Peter McHenry as Oberon, Phil Daniels as Puck, Robert Lindsay as Lysander, Jeffrey Palmer as Quince and Brian Glover as Bottom. An abbreviated version of A Midsummer Night's Dream was made into an animated short with the same title by Walt Disney Television Animation in 1999 as part of the Mouse Tail series. It was featured in a 2002 episode of Disney's House of Mouse, House of Scrooge, Season 3, Episode 34. The star-crossed lovers are played by Mickey Mouse, Lysander, Minnie Mouse, Hermia, Donald Duck, Demetrius, and Daisy Duck, Helena. The character based on Theseus is played by Ludwig von Drake, and the character based on Aegeus by Scrooge McDuck. Goofy appears as an accident-prone puck. The story ends with the revelation that it was a dream experienced by Mickey Mouse while sleeping at a picnic hosted by Minnie. In 2005 Shakespeare told the BBC TV series, aired an updated of the play. It was written by Peter Boker. The cast includes Johnny Vegas as Bottom, Dean Lennox Kelly as Puck, Bill Patterson as Theo, a conflation of Theseus and Aegeus, and Imelda Staunton as his wife Polly. Hippolyta, Lenny James plays Oberon and Sharon Small as Titania, Zoe Tapper and Michelle Bonnard play Hermia and Helena. In a 2006 episode of the Disney Channel show The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody called A Midsummer's Nightmare, the title characters perform in a low-budget production of the play that goes awry. The plot of the episode ironically, and loosely, follows that of the play. BBC One's 2016 production was a 90-minute filmic adaptation by Russell T. Davies directed by David Carr, starring Matt Lucas as Bottom, Maxine Peake as Titania, and with a diverse cast including Nanzo Inozzi as Oberon, Prisca Bicare as Hermia and Hiran Abesekara as Puck. Comic Books In 1960, C. Navarro, Mexico, published a comics adaptation in Tesoro de Quenis Clásicos No. 39, El Sueño de Una Noche de Verano, The Dream for May Night of Summer. Astronomy British astronomer William Herschel named the two moons of Uranus that he discovered in 1787 after characters in the play, Oberon and Titania, another moon, discovered in 1985, has been named Puck. Gallery